All right, we're excited here. He's joining us for the first time on In the Circle. We've been working uh, behind the scenes. Uh, our, our people have been talking to her people, and we've been uh, because she's very busy. Uh, she's a podcast host now, as well as uh, has her own site or podcast. Of course, you can check out wherever you listen to this podcast uh, on all your favorite podcast places. And of course, it's When the Cleats Come Off. She was a three time all region performer, one of the greats to wear the Purdue Boilermaker colors. And, of course, played in the MPF for the Dallas Charge. I speak of Ashley Burkhart joining us. First time in the circle. How you doing? I love it. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> well, let, let, let's let's first start what you've been doing recently, because you're doing a podcast. Ho you're, you're hosting a podcast uh, as well as you're doing. You have your own website, AshleyBTraining.com, where you do a lot of just talk about your kind of how did you get into hosting a podcast and, and your idea here uh, post playing. Oh gosh. Um, so post playing, actually, when I was playing at Purdue, I noticed one of my favorite things was actually working the camps. Um, other than playing, of course, like I had the best experience at Purdue. I loved it so much, but I always noticed I was one of the few to actually love when we hosted camps and little girls came in to like, want to be like us. And I just loved working with them. I started up lessons soon after that. And then Actually, when I was playing professionally, I was still doing some lessons and also coaching as a volunteer. Um, so a lot of that inspiration to want to work with young kids and especially families who are growing in the game, um, working with them was something that I kind of had a passion for in college, but didn't really realize it until I was done playing. So when I finally finished playing, I was going through like, what the heck do I do next? Um, I got a degree in um sports performance. So I wanted to be a strength conditioning coach. Um, so I, I dabbled into coaching a little bit, but I really realized that the youth athlete and helping her chase her dreams and make them happen. That was my jam. So I started doing lessons full time, um, which some people are like, how do you do lessons full time? Well, if you do it right and you're with the right people, you can figure it out. So um, I was doing that. I was doing lessons like five nights a week. Don't recommend, uh, but you had to do what you had to do. Um, but did all that and then, um, started growing in the online business actually in 2019. So before COVID was a thing, I was doing a lot of virtual work, doing a lot of swing analysis and things like that. And then when we hit COVID, um, I realized that a lot of youth athletes felt abandoned almost. They're like, oh my gosh, like I can't go play my favorite sport. I can't express myself. I can't live out my identity as a softball player and beyond. And it, it was, it really hit me that you know, one of the big things that was growing was podcasts. And at first I was like, what are these podcast things? This is weird. I'm not into that. It's like radio. But then I realized, no, it's actually way cooler. Um, and you can basically hop on and share anything that you want. So I got into podcasts myself and then I was like, I just want to create one. So I had a team of a couple people at the time, one actually being my sister, she was interning for me that summer. Um, and I told her, I was like, I want to create a podcast for just for parents, athletes, coaches, anybody that wants to go in the game, how can we have a podcast that can help teach the game? So um, especially the, the game outside the game, like what are you doing outside of games to prepare yourself to make sure you're mentally and physically ready to compete? Um, so that's where my sister, Christina, actually came up with the name uh, When the Cleats Come Off. So a lot of people think it's a podcast about like after you retire. No, it's not. <laughs> It's really, what do you do outside the white lines to prepare for games? So, um, especially for the parents who are like helping their athletes. So that's where, that's where it started. And then I started interviewing people like Sue Inquist, Aubrey Monroe, Monica Abbott, Kat Osterman, and the list just kept going. I'm like, this is fun. Like, I love the connections that I have with people. I love that they get to share their own journeys and their own stories. And I guess that's the long way of sharing how podcasting began for me. No, it's tremendous. You've had great guests. Erica Piscatelli was one of your most recent guests. Uh, yeah. Kat Osterman, you mentioned Monica Abbott. But for those that don't maybe haven't listened to the podcast, it's not just about talking about softball. You're talking about just kind of life in general and fitness too and, you know, mechanical stuff too. Just talk about for those that haven't listened, I uh, had a chance to about describe the podcast. Yeah, so I started off really just wanting to share things that my dad and I would want to look up. Like when I was learning about pitching, like, so when I had guests on the show talking about pitching, I wanted to learn more about that. Like, hey, why is a pitcher like Monica Abbott so dominant? What is she thinking about with the ball in her hand? How is she attacking certain hitters? Kind of dabbling into the mindset aspect. 
Um, when I was coaching or when I went to Purdue, I studied uh, sports psychology was one of the classes that I had. And I noticed that like that sports psychology class helped me actually hit 400 that year um, simply because I actually applied those things that I was learning. So I got into the sports psych stuff. I'm not a sports psychologist myself, but I've had my former sports psych, Dr. Carr on the podcast to talk about that type of stuff. Um, and you're right, the game, it's, it's way more than just the physical. And of course I love hitting. So I talk about hitting a lot, but I really spend a lot of time interviewing people to talk about what's on the other side. Like what is, what is your mindset um, before a big game? What is your, what is your mindset? Um, when, when not much is on the line, like it, it changes. And I, I thought it was really cool to, to, sorry, my dog's barking. Um, but I thought it was really cool to bring that aspect of the game that it's now getting a lot of, um, it, a lot of people are talking about it more now, which is great. Um, but I think that's, that's the part that I, I differentiate myself from most coaches as we dive into the mental aspect, sometimes more than the physical. Yeah, I've noticed that. A lot of mental aspect of it, the physical aspect that goes uh, beyond off the field. How did you prep to become a podcast host? Did you talk to other po hosts? Like, how did you train to just, or you just kind of wing, wing it? I just listened. I just listened to a bunch of other podcasts. So I, I'm into like the entrepreneurial type stuff, leadership podcasts. And I have a few favorites that I would just listen to constantly, like while I'm doing dishes, working out, like I was always listening. Um, so I feel like I'm like a compilation of all my favorite podcasts that I listen to just simply the way the message is pr uh, portrayed um, and things like that. But of course, my first episode to now is like completely different because I'm kind of creating my own space here. But um, yeah, I, I did not ask anybody about podcasting. I kind of just did it. <laughs> Who was your first guest when your first episode or when are, when are your first oh, guest was? My first guest was JT Gasso, the hitting coach for Oklahoma. That's pretty good. So, yeah. So he was actually my hitting coach. Well, not even hitting. He did a lot of hitting stuff, but also defensive stuff for me. But when I was at Purdue, he was an assistant. And so, um, yeah, I thought hard about who was going to be my first guest. I'm like, I'm just going to text JT and have him come on. And it's been one of the top listens. Like, I think it's got over a thousand downloads already. So. Uh, I could believe that. I could believe that. That the old, the elder uh, Gasso we've had on has done very well in our podcast as well. So that doesn't oh, yeah. surprise me. Oh, uh, and oh yeah. When you think of a guest, take me through that process. Cause you're probably like us, where we're trying, we're, we're you know we're trying to think of who be a good guest. Can we get that person? Obviously, there's a you got to organize the schedule to maybe around their schedule to record or yeah. That process is always unique behind the scenes. Take me through that because you're a player. So yeah. obviously you have connections from teammates, former teammates, just take us through the process as you think of booking guests. Yeah. Well, at first I was just like, who do I know? How can I get them on? And then once I landed them, I was like, okay, what are we going to talk about? Um, but now I've kind of shifted that a little bit to um, like right now, I think being relevant is important. So we're in, we're in the thick of college softball season. So I want to get guests that either know a ton about it um, that are talking about it or even in it, I know that's a little bit harder because a lot of players don't have time to do interviews, but I just want to make sure that the topics are relevant to where we are. Um, I also do a lot of like solo episodes, like we're in tryout season, like let's talk about tryouts, things like that. Um, but when it comes to guests, you're right. Like I just had so many connections from the pro league and then they know other people. And so um, it's kind of one of those where just I've gotten to meet amazing people like Caitlin Lowe based on the fact that I landed Natasha Watley and she had Caitlin's number and Sue Inquist even knows her. So it was kind of like you get one person and then they have a bunch of other people they recommend too. So I think that's the fun part. It's like, um, I'm landing interviews that I'm just like, I never thought I'd have on the podcast. Like, it's just so fun. <laughs> I was going to ask you that was, is there a guest that you've had on? You're like, wow, I can't believe that's like awesome that I got that person. I've always wanted to talk to that person and I got him. And who's that person you're still trying to get or want to get if you could, mm -hmm. if it works out. Yeah. Um, well, Sue Inquist obviously was like a jaw dropper for me. Um, but I have to say like Caitlin Lowe was the player that I grew up wanting to be like, literally I moved to the left side to slap when I was 12 I became a power hitter as well. I played outfield. I was small. And so she was like the person that I grew up like idolizing. I'm the oldest, so I don't have an older sibling to look up to. 
So she was kind of like that role model for me. So when I landed that one, my dad was even like, you go girl. Like that is awesome. (laughs) Um, so yeah, I just, that was, that was a big one for me. And then crazy enough, I've had my sister on recently and like, I didn't realize how much I was going to love that. (laughs) Um, until we were like, just talking and I was like, this is so fun. Even my podcast editors, like you need to have her on more often. Uh, she should be like a co-host. I'm like, okay, like we could do this. I would love that. Um, but I think somebody that I'm looking, like, I would really like to land for the podcast. Mm, There's just so many, like even like non-softball people I'd love to have on, but sorry, my dog is a little obnoxious right now. Um, I mean, that's funny. You said Patty already, but I think Patty Gasso would be an incredible guest. Like I just want to pick her brain. And I know you probably feel the same way being a podcast host. It's like, how do you pick the brain of the person that you're interviewing? Yes. She's somebody that I would definitely want to just dive into and talk softball with so bad. <laughs> she's fantastic. So I recommend, yeah, if you could pull it off, she, uh, she's fantastic and down to earth. I mean, we just had her on obviously before the season. She talked about it being a Dodger <laughs> fan, throwing out a first pitch at a Dodger game, stuff like that. And I know that's part of it too, from listening to some of your episodes is, it's like having a conversation, right? It's kind of like, you don't want it to be structured or anything. It's like, Hey, it's just, we're talking, you know, two people talking. Mm -hmm. Totally. That's what it is. I mean, I want it to be more of a, like, you can even ask me questions. Like, let's just have a full on conversation. I think my best conversations are when they're asking me questions. Like, I love that. I love just the feedback. So, um, it is kind of like one of the things that I'm just a very curious person. So um, I try not to talk too much off the cuff because I really just want to dive into questions that I have in the interview. So it makes it almost feel natural when you just simply make it about the, the person you're interviewing. What uh, you mentioned your sister, Christina, I actually I spoke to her at uh, Michigan Media Availability before mm-hmm. the season and she's definitely a talker. Uh, <laughs> that, so uh, <laughs> What has that been like? I know you've been following her around, but obviously she's been a big story. Obviously at Michigan, was at North Carolina, helping the the Wolverines out this season. Now she's in the Big Ten like you were in the Big Ten one there. What's that been like following her? Um, A dream. Uh, that's the thing. It's like when I was actually coaching in the college game for a bit, uh, I couldn't watch her play. And, and to me, that really, I don't want to say broke my heart, but I loved coaching, but I love watching my sister be the best version of herself on the field and have an absolute blast sometimes even more. So, um, I was sharing this with you before, uh, we started recording, but literally I will do anything to try to go watch her compete because she teaches me so much just by simply watching. And, uh, and just, I've never seen her have so much fun playing the game. I mean, she loved UNC. She loved playing there. Um, she's being challenged in a new way at Michigan. Um, and she's thriving. And it's like one of those things where it's like when you're at the right place at the right time and you feel like this, the entire group around you supports you no matter what, like you can do anything. And I think she's kind of living that right now. I'm sure she asked you when she made the move, uh, any advice as far as what you gave her as far as what's it like to be in the Big Ten, playing in the Big Ten, which she's about to, you know, she's starting to do now as they get into conference play. And then obviously being at Michigan, playing for Coach Hutch, I mean, that's uh, an amazing honor. I know that was something that when I talked to her was a big thing to her is playing for Coach Hutch, having that honor. Yeah, I think it's one of those where I didn't really have to say much. Like she's her own person. She's a different athlete than I was, but um, all in all, the same things that we share, the fact that we are very coachable and whatever setting that you're put in, like just do the best that you can with what you have. And I think she's truly taken that to another level um, here at Michigan because of how great the coaching staff is, how great the players are around her. She literally told me once that um, she's never played on a team where every single hitter in the lineup, she is confident will get a hit at that time. Like she's just overall, um, you know, playing at a different level, but also just being exposed to different types of play. I think Hutch has seen it all. So I think she's been able to guide her a lot. How competitive were you two get as you were growing up? and you know playing softball there I was I would imagine was was it super competitive um well me being five years older I wish that I was closer in age because we would have been a lot more competitive a lot of us growing up was really I would be hitting in the backyard with dad and Christina would be like can I go hit too so it was kind of like uh she was following but she wasn't always like 
um, competing with me, I should say, because we were just so different in ages. Um, now I will say my youngest sister, Anna, who's three years younger than her, they are a lot more competitive than they were growing up. Um, but I, I think I was just too old, you know, to really be a competitor. But I think um, we definitely did play like games in the backyard. Like we'd make up games and we'd totally compete there. And that was just fun. Like, I don't remember that being any like nasty head to head stuff. It was just like, yeah, I'm going to beat you. Um, but it was like, that, that was just fun to us. So um, I don't think competitive, like we weren't super competitive other than like those backyard settings as much, but I think of anything they we've always just supported each other a ton, which has do, been awesome. Do you, you know, obviously I've always heard when players stop playing, it's kind of like, it's tough to kind of get that rush of playing on the field, having that competition. Are you kind of living through her to some extent, especially when you're there at the games through her? Like, are you kind of, is that kind of, what's it like being in the stands, watching her play and compete and you being in the stands? Yeah. I mean, I get it. I get why my parents are, you know, every parent, you know, feels for their athlete and wants them to do well. I think that, um, it's, it's crazy because we are very similar. We both hit from the left side. And so sometimes I kind of like put myself in her situation. Like what would I be thinking right now? Um, the funny thing. Okay. I got a little story. I watched her play in uh, Florida versus USF. Um, or no, it might've, it might've been USF. It might've been another team, but either way, it was a situation where the corners were back because she hit like a double in her last at bat. And I was like, she should totally drop one right now. She should drop a thought right now. And I like turn on my phone. Cause I'm like, I'm going to manifest this and it's going to happen. And literally she drops a bunt is safe at first. And then like, there's an overthrow and she gets a second and I go nuts. I'm like, this is just so fun. Like playing the game, I guess you could say through her, but in a way to where she's also doing things that like I would have never done, but like they're working. So it's really cool to learn from her, um, and her experience. How did you get involved in softball growing up? What got you into playing softball? Um, well, we played every sport. Like, I think I remember playing soccer, volleyball, basketball, softball, obviously. I think baseball actually happened before softball. Um, I was playing baseball with like my local neighbor kids. Um, didn't really, I don't remember playing much to be completely honest. And of course I probably wasn't even that good, but I started off with baseball and talk about the competitors. Like those neighborhood boys were like the biggest competitors in my eyes at that time. Like, because they were like, they never handed anything to me. They picked on me because I was the girl. And it was like one of those fun, also like crazy times where I was learning a lot about myself, but I think them pushing me a little bit allowed me to kind of dabble into baseball. And then I was like, Oh, there's a bunch of girls. Like, let's go play with them. Let's be, let's be like everybody else, you know? Um, but started playing like little league rec ball, whatever, like pretty young age. I think it was like eight or so when I, when I started playing softball and then again, was continuing to play all the other sports too. But as I got into high school, I realized that like softball was really that love for me. Um, I was playing basketball at the time as well. Um, but then I kind of just like carried on with it because it was just, I lived it. I breathed it. I didn't want anything else, you know, that's wild. Uh, how much of your podcast is influenced by your upbringing? The fact that, you know, you mentioned you started off in baseball, you know, now everybody can get start early in softball, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, how much of that did also influence your podcast and everything you've been doing as well? Well, every experience that I have or can remember has been influenced by the podcast. Um, I recently interviewed my dad. Um, his episode is not up yet, um, but we were literally just like reminiscing on on the good days, you know, um, just from when I started playing sports to started getting into softball, started getting into basketball, just like all of the experiences that I've had playing any sport has really led to where this podcast is. And I think, again, I just remember trying to figure out pitching and my dad and I would research YouTube videos for hours and hours and hours to try to figure it out. And that's where I thought, you know, why can't we create a softball outlet or resource to help people learn the game as well in a new way that didn't exist when I was younger. So I think kind of creating something that I wish I would have had is kind of the dream. And so I always look down at that younger Ashley who is growing in the game, the younger, my dad also trying to figure out the game with me, like what are the resources that we would have wanted? And that's what's definitely influenced the podcast for sure. 
How'd you end up at uh, West Lafayette playing at Purdue? How did I end up there? Yeah. Um, so I was kind of that kid who I got better every year, but like, honestly, I don't think I was really that good going into college. And I don't want to say that, but I wasn't really looked at by many colleges. Like it was, I had a few that I visited. Like I went to Michigan state ball state was my first ever offer. Um, I went up to Ohio for a few schools. I went to, I was thinking about Boston university. It was kind of like, just like a small pool of colleges that were looking at me. Also, I was kind of later in the game. Um, when I, when I joined a really high level travel team, um, but I just visited a few schools and as soon as I got to Purdue, it really felt like home. It's one of those things that I'm, I'm sure you've heard. You like, don't know why, but like, you knew this was where you're supposed to be. Um, and that's where I was with Purdue. So it was one of those that it was a no brainer <laughs> when I got to campus. Well, you had a great career there. You're three straight all region perform uh, honors there. Uh, you, I think you hold the school record for most stolen bases in a game. You're in the top 10 top. You've hit 335 in your career, which was fifth all time. You're in the top 10 in a ton of categories. Too many to get a hold of. We have to go a second podcast to run over throughout your resume there, but describe for those, you know, cause you went from there to play professionally for the Dallas charge, which we'll talk about for those that didn't see you play, describe your style of game. Cause you mentioned earlier, you're different than your sister. Mm-hmm. Um, I mostly talk about this from an offensive performance, but I'm very quick. I love making the defense look stupid, <laughs> um, which is why I got into slapping originally. Um, but I just love being a threat. And so <clears throat> as a lefty, I was a slapper for a while and then turned hitter solely. Um, I just loved, I loved challenging the defense a ton. Um, and then I guess defensively I was, I was like an all or nothing. It was like, I'm going to go at everything as hard as I can. And I'll surprise myself a lot, but um, it's funny. I've never been asked that question, but everything was all in no matter what. And if you ever saw me not going all in, like there was probably a problem. <laughs> Got to go leave it on the field. Were you a vocal leader? Were you quiet? What, were you, what kind of personality were you like? I really was the quiet leader. Um, my sister would probably say the same. It's so funny because now I, I have a podcast. Yeah. That I talk about. Yeah. Um, but I was like the person who we were doing sprints. I didn't really say much. I just got the sprint done. You know, I didn't like to exert energy outside of um, what needed to be done. But I also did feel like when there were times where something needed to be said, I would say it. So it was one of those where. I guess you could say an introverted leader, but um, I, I was very passionate. I could say though, like, like when my pitcher Lily would like have this amazing strikeout, I was super loud. I was super engaged, like excited. Um, but from a leadership aspect, I don't really think I was that much vocal as I was performance, like just go all out, do everything that you can to win. Um, and I was a little bit quieter as a leader, I guess. You got drafted in the NPF draft by the charts. Do you remember that night when you got drafted? Are you kidding me? That's my favorite story. <laughs> well, tell it. I want to hear it. it. Um, yes, I remember that night. Uh, I did. Ha I had no clue I would even be considered until the day before my head coach um, called me into her office and she said, hey, uh, they're thinking about putting you in to potentially be drafted tomorrow. Would you want your name in? I was like, hang on, what? Like, are you, what, what is the NPF? Like I, I knew what it was, but it really wasn't like anything that I had thought for myself at all. Um, I said, yeah, like, of course. So I said, yes, the next day we're playing against ball state at home. And I'm telling you the whole game, I had no idea that the draft was happening. I had no clue because it was one of those like tight games. It's like, they would score two runs. We'd score two runs. We'd score a run. They'd score a run. It was just back and forth, just battle. We ended up winning that game. Um, and again, kind of like forgot about it all, forgot about the draft, forgot anything was going on. And then I look up at my dad as we're singing the fight song at the very end, I'm looking up at my dad and he's like, you were drafted 15. <laughs> and I was seriously just going, I, I didn't know the chair anymore. I was just in shock. Um, and it was funny because my coach thought she was the first one to tell me, cause I went into the dugout and then she ended up telling me and. Um, but yeah, when my dad said that, I was like, oh, this is real. This is a thing. Okay. So screw the internship that I had. 
uh, we'll, we'll scratch that and go play. Um, but yeah, that was the moment and it was something I'll never forget. I can tell you, I remember that draft very well. I was covering the Orlando Magic game at the time, but I was covering it because Kaylee Novak, who ended mm-hmm. up being your teammate, played at UCF. Yeah. I covered UCF, was the broad, still broadcast their games. So I was interested. I knew she was in the draft, so I knew where she was going. So I'm looking at each pick while I'm doing my other gig, which is covering a Magic game. So I've got the draft on, and then I'm looking at each pick, and I remember you got picked right before her. She went the next pick. And I, you know, and I'll be honest. I was more biased towards Kaylee at the time. So I'm like, why is that person picked ahead of her? Why? And then you got picked. I'm like, oh, why is she picked ahead of her? But then she got picked again. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. So you two ended up going back to back draft picks there. Uh, mm-hmm. That which was pretty cool. So I do remember you getting drafted. Uh, I'm obviously happy you got drafted now. Maybe you know, seven years ago, I was a little confused. You know, I was like, oh, why is she I ahead of Kaylee? All right, all right. I so, I, so I apologize. You know, I didn't even know why I was ahead of anybody else, but <laughs> here we are. Well, no. Now in retrospect, you know, now I understand. You, you, you definitely were worthy of the the selection. What was the experience like playing uh, for the Charge? It was the toughest two years of my life. I think it was, I had never really been challenged in that way to be, um, to have to work as like, I don't want to say to have to work to play, but you know, I had never at Purdue been to a regional. Like that was something that like, I've never seen before. And I was aware of it. Um, I had a coach who said something along the lines of like, well, I don't see you starting in front of these like women's college world series champions or, you know, players in the women's college world series. And that was the first time I let somebody else kind of dictate how I felt about my game. Um, And so I struggled a lot. I was a pinch runner a lot. (laughs) Um, Didn't get a whole lot of starts or opportunities really for a year and a half. Um, But then I kind of a year and a half in, I literally like was playing against Team USA. I was starting that game because it was an exhibition game. It wasn't didn't really count for a record. Um, But so Kaylani Ricketts is on the mound. Lauren Chamberlain's at first. Shelby Penley's at short. Uh, somebody's in, like, it was just like stacked. And I'm just sitting there like, my best performances at Purdue were against the best opponents. Like, why not me? So I literally just stepped in the box and I went two for three that game. And I was like, okay, I'm back. Um, but it was really hard for me um, at first because um, that was the first time I really had a coach who, who didn't really express belief in me, um, which which I was lucky to be at that point and never had, but I kind of wish I would have because I feel like I would have showed up differently and wouldn't have really let those words get to me like they did. Um, But after I kind of unleashed a year and a half later, I started becoming myself, hitting home runs again, playing, playing my game. Um, And then, and then I was done actually after that season, but it really taught me a ton and probably has influenced this podcast as well. And my coaching, everything that I deliver now. Why did you decide to stop playing? Uh, was it just one of those things you were just kind of done with it? Was it a situation it wasn't worth it? Because, look, it's no secret. The pros, uh, there's finance issues there. You know, you can't make a living there. I've known a ton of players that told me, hey, I would play forever, but I have to, you know, I have to have, a, you know, pay bills and do things. How about, what, what, what went into your decision process there? Um, well that winter I actually got, we, I think changed managers. Um, and they, I got an email. It was like a two sentence email saying we're getting rid of you. Um, (laughs) which was really heartbreaking. Um, but also it was one of those where it was like, well, is this it? Um, and so I contemplated like trying out for other teams, like a, a few months, I was really contemplating if I wanted to keep going. Um, but like you said, it was one of those, it's like, when do you, when do you stop? Um, so, um, it was one of those where I feel like now if I went back and tried to play, I probably would have still gotten better. Like my whole game, my whole MO was I'm always getting better. Um, hence the last part of my pro career. Um, but I was, I was kind of just ready uh, to stop. Um, I still dabble with it though. Cause I'm like, if a, if a, were a thing, like <laughs> I totally still be playing. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a hard decision, um, but it was one of those that I thought out as much as I could. I was also with my boyfriend, who's now my husband now um, at the time, and, and I really started thinking about the future and what I wanted. Um, so a lot of things went into it, but I'm, I'm happy that I made the decision that I did. 
What's it going to take, you think, for a pro league to be successful? You mentioned Athletes Unlimited. They just got through two seasons. Uh, there's another pro league in the works as well. As somebody who's been there for a couple of years, you saw probably the good and the bad, everything. What Can it be successful in the States? We know it is in Japan, uh, and that's where a lot of players go to play in Japan. I'm just curious from your perspective, what would it take uh, to be successful in the States, and can it be successful in the States? It's funny you mentioned that about Japan because I had Natasha Watley on recently um, and she's played in Japan, still coaches in Japan. And I'm like, why are you still there? Like there's something there that we need to unleash. Um, but she was talking about how all the teams over in Japan, and I'm not sure how much you know about this. I was kind of new to knowing this, but like to team Toyota, team Honda, like those are really, really well-known companies that literally it's a line item in their budget to host or to have teams. Um, and they're not making that much money off of it. Um, but literally their thought process behind it is we are going to invest in this so that we can create the best softball players in the world so that we can compete at the world stage and go win. And what did they do these past two Olympics that we've been in? They've dominated. And I truly believe it's because of the system that they've built. Um, and again, Natasha Watley definitely brought this to my attention. And I think there's still more to unpack, but um, I really love athletes unlimited. Like I said, um, from the feedback that I've heard from the majority of the players is like, it's an experience that they will never forget. Um, it's, they love the game there. It's so much fun. Obviously the rules are kind of funky and weird, but like they've all bought into it and are just playing like, and having so much fun. Um, so yes, if that would have existed when I played, um, I would totally have tried out because I'm a huge fan of it. Who knows? Maybe my sister will play in it one day. That would be cool. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's, a, I think what they're doing is amazing. And I think the airtime that they've been getting is great. Um, I love where that is going. Um, I'm not sure what other pro softball, how that'll make it. But um, I think if we try to adopt something similar to what Japan is doing, then we can definitely um, <clears throat> funnel a system to help create the best players and make sure they show up um on the biggest stages yeah it's really invested in the sport i mean i've had players talk to similar tell me similar about japan uh and you know that's why they've been successful as a gold medal that's that's part of it they you know they have that camaraderie there that they're most of their best players are playing in those leagues too so meanwhile you're bringing in the best some of the best players in the Amer americans to play over there you're gonna have the best league uh yeah. it's no different than yeah. you know it's amazing we, we do have the best players in the world. I think it's just a matter of making sure they're brought up and um, are competing at the highest level throughout the, the year, you know? Right. And, and hopefully the Olympics is going to play a factor in that. We'll see if it gets back in 28. I just had Georgina Corrick on, the USF pitcher, who pitched for Great Britain. And she said, you know, she wants to continue to play for Great Britain to help build that and the funding. She feels that, you know, other places have that advantage of the funding. They feel like if Europe can develop that funding, they can develop good softball players. And that's kind of the, I feel like everybody's kind of rallied around this about developing the game and funding in the game from lower level all the way to the international level. Have you noticed that being around the game? There's more emphasis on that now, more talk about it than before. Yeah, I, th I think so. And I think the fact that we're on TV so much is, is a testament to it. I think, I think it definitely is growing. Um, I'm excited to have a couple guests on to kind of dive into that a little bit deeper soon, but um, yeah, I, I think the, the way of the, the game funding, any of it, it's all growing and it's so fun to see. Give me your thoughts on the big 10, how you see it now to compare to when you were a player. It seems from the outside, it's grown. I mean, they're off to a great start as we record this, the big 10's the fifth rated conference in college softball. And I've spoken to many coaches in the league there's a chip on the shoulder. They didn't feel they got treated well last year. It's a unique year where they couldn't play non-conference, things like that. They've they've been off to a really good start. Michigan's part of that, but there's other programs, Ohio State, Minnesota, Wisconsin, on and on and on. Your thoughts on the Big Ten now that you've a few years away from it, what do you see from the Big Ten compared to when you were a player in the league? I think from a competitive standpoint, they're definitely winning more games than we ever have. Um Again, I say we because I obviously was in the Big Ten, but I can't keep saying we because I have to be also acknowledging other other conferences. But they have, I mean, think about Northwestern, like what they have done, the teams that they have beaten, like where is this coming from? Um, there's other teams that are doing great. I mean, 
obviously Michigan's only losses are against top 25 teams, mostly top 10 teams at this point. Um, so it's been really cool to see um, the Big Ten really make a statement. Because I feel like when I played, like, they rarely were, except for like Sierra Romero <laughs> um, and obviously Michigan. But um, it's been cool to see. And I think there, there's still a long way to go for the Big Ten. I think just talent wise, there's 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 potential um, to do make an even bigger impact um, altogether. But um, it's been fun to watch, especially I mean, I how can you not love the fact that Northwestern's beaten UCLA, Clemson, Oregon and Washington? Like, that's just like wild. I know they have other losses, but I think it's just like, OK, like, what are they doing? It's one of those where I just want to go interview them and see how they're doing this. Um, but it's fun to see. I think, again, we have a long way to go um, to start competing more with like SEC and Pac-12 and things like that. But it's it's fun to watch. Is the support there behind the scenes from a facility standpoint in the Big Ten? I mean, you just went to Kentucky this year to see Michigan play there. You say the facilities Kentucky has for softball. Facilities has become a huge topic in softball. Everybody's renovating or, you know, getting new stadiums. Clemson's invested in the stadiums. Is that something you see in the Big Ten committing to? Uh, Because that's, for me, from the outside, that's always been the question that I've had from the Big Ten standpoint is, do they support softball over there uh do they, they back them because the coaches are good there's great athletes there but do they have the backing that other conferences like the sec has really set a standard for the other conferences to kind of duplicate from a facility standpoint from an exposure standpoint what do you see from the big 10 is that can it get to that level um yeah i mean so my senior year i had a 13 million dollar stadium built and nobody's seen it except for really people that live close by or in the big 10 like i think that's just wild to me like if we could have some sort of a fall season and host Alabama like they'd look at our place and be like whoa like this is cool um so I think that's like th there is definitely great stadiums in the Big Ten um but they're not going to get seen if they're in a cold state at this point so this is something that I was into back when I played and I was on I was in Big Ten SAC and it was kind of a topic then um but we have the facilities we have the backing like our athletics department is here for us um i think even purdue's getting a brand new stadium um a jumbotron built it's there um it's just one of those where it's crazy how one stadium and what it looks like can dictate where a kid goes to a school um i just think that's like wild um but it's i mean it makes sense but i committed to purdue and we had a podunk field that had porta potties so i'm not quite sure <laughs> um I'm not quite sure how, how the emphasis is getting on the stadium, but I think the Big Ten, what they do well is that they really, I mean, obviously it's important for to have um, everything that you need to be able to succeed. We had that, um, and I know other schools in the Big Ten, if not all of them, have the same things. Um, but also, like, the academic standpoint is something that, like, they pride themselves on a ton. So I think finding the athlete who can be both and be both well, like, that's, that is an emphasis at, in the Big Ten level that I noticed. What was your favorite Big Ten facility you played at? Before ours, Michigan. I've heard that. What is what is it about Michigan? And is there, when you're playing in the Big Ten, is there a bit of an, a, a, a thing where you have to almost block off the jersey? It's Hutch. Is there an intimidating factor playing a Michigan? Playing at Michigan, it's more than just the stadium. Like the amount of fans that they got for their fall ball games when I was watching my sister, it blew me away. That was more fans than we we had in season sometimes at Purdue. So I think not only is it the stadium, it's the people that are there watching. Like you think of like Rhodes Stadium, and I think they had like 3,200 uh, 3, uh, season passes. Like, holders, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. season, and I'm just like, it's more than just the stadium right? Like, and I played at that stadium and it's true. Like it's the, the lights are brighter, the environment's more exciting. Like I think the fans have a big, a big thing to do with it as well. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was always pretty crazy going to Michigan, especially, I mean, there's Hutch, but like, you have to remember, like, she's not on the field. You have to, you have to really focus on the people that are on the field. Um, if you want to be able to beat them. Um, but yeah, of course it's a factor, but still it's, though, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, I would still, is. I still think it's kind of an, you got to be a little bit in awe though. And like Hutch is giving you a handshake after the game or something like that. Yeah, of course. I mean, the fun part that I love about Hutch and other great coaches out there is that if you have a good performance, they're going to tell you, 
you know, like they're not just going to shake your hand and roll their eyes. No, they're like in it. They, they are here for the competition. They love shouting out players that do well. Um, and it's not that I tried to do extra well against touch, but I had a couple of times where I played well against them and, and she was just like, you're a great player. And I think it's like one of those, it's like, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Like, I love, I love that, that somebody else sees it too. I don't know. It's just cool. Have you gotten to interact with her now with, since with Christina there? I have. Yeah. She's actually uh, reached out to me a few times. Um, just being at the game, she'll talk to me about hitting every once in a while. So it's pretty cool to, to, to see how curious she still is, you know, like it doesn't matter, you know, how long you've been in the game, you can always learn more. And she's just always learning. I love that about her. That's one you're probably going to have on your podcast uh, list there, uh, Hutch at some point. Oh, guaranteed. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> that needs to, that needs to happen. I mean, I've had her on too. And she, that's, that's always a uh, tremendous there uh, from to, to talk to her about the game and everything uh, like that. Now I've noticed by the way, Michigan and Purdue do not play in this nope. wacky Big Ten, which we're not going to get into how bizarre the Big Ten schedule in. You don't play everybody, and it's whatever. It's a long, complicated deal. You, They don't play. Michigan and Purdue do not play this year. Are you relieved about that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I love the honesty there because I was worried. Like, if they play, what would you do? I'd wear Michigan, of course. I oh. have to support my sister. Um, but a part of me obviously wants to see my old school do well. So I'm very relieved. So no cross like Michigan slash Purdue gear going on there? Like, did you keep yeah. your jerseys from Purdue? Did you get to keep any of your gear? I got one jersey. It's hanging up in my basement now. Wow. Um, but I have tons of gear. Like, of course, I have a lot of gear that I was given as a coach and also a player. So I'm stacked. Even my puppy jacket, I still have that. <laughs> And I need it where I live. Right. That's freaking. All right. So you're relieved and you're kind of hoping, all right, let's not cross paths in the Big Ten title game unless it's like maybe the, you know, unless it's the Big Ten title game, let's not cross paths, basically. Yeah. Woo, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can hear your voice. Uh, what's your thoughts on the game now? You mentioned there's so much of it, TV, but there's a lot of it. It's evolved. There is yeah. a transfer portal now. There's name, image, and likeness in the game. Uh, there's going to be instant replay coming to the game. It's going to be instant replay in the postseason. What's been your thoughts on the game today? Give me the replay. Oh my gosh. Watching it from home and seeing the play get called. And here's the thing, you know, as a player who was pretty dominant in the big 10, I had, I didn't have umpires that I just hated because here's the deal. They're going to screw up. Right. And most of them own it. And I think that's the beautiful part about the game, but um, it's really hard to see a bad play call, especially during like the most important games so i think when it comes to replay like i'm here for that like give me that that's all i've ever wanted um but i think it's gonna also um it's gonna it's gonna make games not feel like so heart-wrenching at the same time because i feel like sometimes when games would end last play called was not a correct call like i think that's happened way too many times and the fact that that's not going to happen this postseason makes me so happy <laughs> um yeah, but I mean, other than that, it's just so cool to be able to just throw on my sister on the TV whenever I'm home. Like, it's like the game, it's so easy to access now. Um, and I, and I, growing up with my dad, the only games we got to watch was the Women's College World Series and uh, the Olympics. Like, that was pretty much the only thing that was on TV, um, at least all the games. And so the fact that you can basically watch like almost every single team compete, if not listen, um, I think it's just, why not dabble into this? Like, this is again, where I say you have so much access to it. You have to be able to watch it. If you want to grow in this game, you have to watch it. And now it's everywhere. And so I feel like it's going to level up softball even more from a talent standpoint, um, everywhere, especially with young kids being able to watch the game and watch the best do what they do. Have you had a chance to partake in the uh, women's college world series in person? Um, no, I played in that stadium when I was playing pro, um, but right. I had not, I had not, that was like two weeks after the women's college world series. So no, I've never been. Um, and I, and I definitely, it's a bucket list for me. Right. Yeah. I know you're hoping that maybe this year, fingers crossed, you're <laughs> hoping, I know you're hoping for that. Uh, what was your thoughts last year when the whole scheduling women's college world series controversy came up with the rain delay and having to play late night they have expanded the schedule there what was your as somebody who's been a student athlete what was your what was your thoughts as that was all going on in Oklahoma City last year 
Yeah, that was a rumble. Um, I obviously not playing at that level, like at the women's college world series ever. Um, it's hard to say from, from over here, but I think as an athlete who's being told to go play double header after double header and also not get a day break, like, I mean, people are complaining about men's basketball playing within 24 hours of each other. And I get it. Like that is definitely a sport where you're exuding a lot, a lot of energy in regards to just stamina. Um, but I think like it's a mentally and physically draining sport that needs rest. And if you're not getting the rest, you're not going to be able to perform at your best and you need your best when it's needed at the women's college world series. So, I mean, the only good thing was everybody had, I think a level playing field when it came down to that. Um, but I think just adding more time, adding more rest, it's only going to elevate this women's college world series. And I'm excited to see what happens this year. Yeah, physically and mechanically, right? I mean, you, you know, if you get, you know, that that's that's going to be a big impact on that. I'm curious also the out of the box role. They put that in a few years ago. They've adjusted it this year. It used to be now where if you were out of the box, it'd be an automatic out. Now it's a strike or a result of the play. As somebody who slapped a little bit, what's your opinion on that role? I, I understand the importance of it. It's just so hard when you're moving towards a pitch and it starts going outside to not kind of shift that way. So I think I agree, like what they're doing this year is much better than what they did originally. The amount of outs that were called based on hit or slappers being out of the box. It's like, it sucks because it's really not your fault. It's just the like, if I was a pitcher, I'd throw everything outside a little bit off the plate just so they have no chance of even getting there and could be called out. Um, but I think where they're going with it now, it, I understand the importance of it and I, and I agree with it. Um, but I think the amount of strictness I've seen umpires have on it, it's a little less, which kind of makes the game flow a little bit more. Um, so I kind of forget what your question was, but I think, I think it's going in the right direction. Um, and does it me does it mess with a, a hitter mentally though? Is that is that something that could affect us? Yeah. It does. How much does it affect you? Because you're constantly now have to worry about being in the box. Yeah, I mean, it takes your focus away from the pitch. It truly does. It takes it away from yourself um, if you let it. And I and I mean, it really. I saw a lot of slappers really struggle mentally um, with it because I was coaching in the game at the time when they put it together, and it's yeah. it's frustrating. And as a as a hitter um who worked really really hard to do this thing for like 10 years being able to be told like oh you have to figure out in a year how to not do that it's really really tough um and it would totally would have gotten to me mentally if if i was in that game uh that was and i was getting called that um but it's it's one of those challenges where like the best are going to be able to figure out how to make it work and some of them are, some players are just gonna get too frustrated and it's gonna impact their game but um, it definitely was a huge challenge for hitters, um, slappers. It's so hard. It's so hard. If I put you in charge, you can make a decision, um, uh, add something, take something out, add something to the sport of softball at any level you want. Could be college, could be pro, could be youth league, travel ball. What would you want to see in the game? Mm. <laughs> Replay, but we're getting that. Um it's so hard. I think I love the game the way it is. Um, this one's tough. I'm going to need like an hour to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, the game is so good. I mean, obviously I'm sure some people have like immediate answers here, but I'm just one of those players who was just like, okay, if this is a role, I'm going to figure out how to make it work. So I don't know. Like, I don't know. Is there anything really... that, and there's anything, I mean, what youth league, anything you would think there, I've heard people that saying that, you know, maybe they're not being as, you know, there's too much kind of like, Hey, everybody, this is a great player. So I'm going to showcase you for every other inning and not developing players. I've had coaches tell me they wish softball players actually would play other sports. There's a risk of burnout. If you, you know, they're being pushed too sure. hard. Uh, you know, I've heard that in the youth league a little bit there on that level. Uh, I don't oh, know. Yeah. So, I guess with youth or actually in general, it's not really a rule or anything, but I wish egos would get out of the way. Yeah. Like egos really are like a huge thing that's hurting our game um, from a youth level standpoint um, more than anything, because it's, it's like one of those where it's like, you for it's, you forget that like the player is the actual important person in this, in this 
room, right? Um, and I think in general, even at the college level, like the player is the most important. So being able to make sure that their, their, their needs are being taken care of and making sure that they're mentally and physically um, prepared to win. I think the mental game, again, diving into it a little bit, there should be more of an emphasis on it. I think um, social media doesn't help at all either. I think one of those things where like if I had access to as much social media as as players do now, I would probably struggle mentally. Um, so being able to figure out how to, um, you know, have a bad performance, but be able to um, feel motivated to go back out and compete rather than feel really bad about yourself and sulk because all these other people are like living and dying based on whether you won or not. Um, I think that really bugs me a lot in the game, but yeah, I wish there was a way that that could be taught more. You mentioned you're going to have your dad on, their, on the podcast, too. I, well, how important is it to have parents that are supportive of you as a player, but at the same time not be at the detriment of the team that the player is playing for? Because you know what I'm talking about. We've I've seen this. It's the one thing I wish is there's too many parents, and we get it. They're passionate about their kid. But they get too passionate where it's at the expense of the team, where they're too negative on the team or the coaches, other teammates, which is not fair to that particular player. Uh that's kind of my thing. I wish that I have seen a bit too much, especially in the youth league, but this happens at all levels, college level. I've seen it too, where I'm like, Oh, I kind of cringe there a little bit. Is that, is that something that concerns you maybe, uh, uh, from being around the game? Yeah. I mean, it's everywhere, whether it's at the college game or youth level, I think, um, it's one thing to be passionate for your player, but it's also another to live and die on how they're, how they perform. Um, I think just making sure that I've learned this from Sue Anquish. She talked about this on the podcast, how parents should literally sit through a game and not say a word and just watch, like watch it like a movie. Because if you watch it like a movie, you're going to one, absorb more, see your kid react, fail, but also figure out how to, how to succeed instead of being told what to do a lot. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, parents who want their kids to do so well that they just like keep telling them what to do instead of let them figure it out on their own, let them fail, let them grow um, and be there when, when the kid needs them. I think that's where, you know, I've interviewed so many people on the podcast and that's a commonality between the best of the best. It's like their parents were always there, but they were supportive. They were, um, figuring out ways with them to succeed. They were, um, you know, not, not being, you know, quiet or having this, obviously everybody had a bad car ride home conversation experience. Most people did. Um, but kind of just knowing that their parents, they, they will do whatever it takes for them to succeed, but also let them fail. It's like the commonality. It's like, oh yeah, if you're trying to tell your kid over and over and over what to do, they're not going to be able to think for themselves and the best can think for themselves. So I think that's a really important aspect. And, you know, my dad taught me a ton of that as well. And, and that's why I'm looking forward to that episode. I think it's a pretty good idea that, that, that you're bringing them on because there's that fine act. You want to support your kid, but you also have to be, there's that honesty part too. You can't, you know, too many parents think their kid's the greatest player ever, but you know, there might be a kid that's better than you on that team. It's not because yeah. the coach is playing favorites. There's that balancing yeah. act too, that I think is, it's not easy uh, from a parent standpoint. We're not, nobody's suggesting that's an easy thing because you care about that person. Uh, obviously as a daughter and everything, but there is that balancing act. That's a great point. I mean, if I wasn't the best player on the team, I wasn't playing. And that's just, and my dad was the coach. <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of those where it's like, he's, and he played college basketball. So he understands this. Um, but if you're not playing, there's a reason and we need to go figure out the reason and go get good at that thing. So, I mean, he's instilled so many things in me. I'm excited for this episode too. I don't know when it's airing yet though, because he wants me to take out some things, which he's the first guest to to want to edit things from the podcast but it's fine i'll do whatever he wants i guess he got me to where i am so i have to listen yeah to you, owe it, you owe it to him yeah that, it makes sense you owe it to him that's uh that's pretty funny uh that's well i'm looking forward to that episode uh we can spend more hours on that where do you play basketball he played at ipfw in fort wayne that's a heck of an athletic uh family background y'all have going on over there huh yeah and yeah, i know it's it's insane i think this is also why i started a podcast because my youngest sister also plays college volleyball so it's like a lot of parents are simply asking like how how did you guys get this good and i'm like well my dad and my mom of course too like they they were huge parts in our success and so i just want to share that on the podcast where is she playing volleyball at 
She's at Old Dominion. Man, you're all over spread out. <laughs> I know, we're everywhere. I know. It's a lot of different sports, though. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Well, tell the audience where they can find your podcast and your website and everything you're doing and uh, where they, what's the easiest way to, if they have to reach out to you, if they got questions, because I know you get questions, feedback on your shows and, and just softball stuff in general, where can they find you? Absolutely. Well, my DMs are always open. So I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I probably spend more time on Twitter, which is like wild because most people are probably like, wait, you're on Instagram a lot. I love Twitter. Let's be real. Um, so slide into my DMs anywhere. Seriously, any questions that people have, totally. I'm, I'm an open book. Um, and I also have a lot of resources on my YouTube channel as well. Ashley Burkhart training. Um, I do a lot of hitting stuff, a lot of mental skills. Every interview that I've done on the podcast is also there. Um, except for Sue Inquest, but that's another story for another day. Um, but you can find me there, my website, www.ashleybtraining.com. You can check out the podcast there or when the cleats come off is on any podcast platform that you have. So I'm kind of everywhere and I am pretty much doing this alone. I have help on certain aspects, but I love how you were like, she's hard to get to her people. I'm like, no, I'm the people like I I'm the only one looking at all of these different things, but um, definitely working on getting getting my team larger as well so I can make sure I get to every single thing that people have. Well, my co-host, Victor, producer, who first reached out to you, he, he's, he's willing uh, to help you. He's a fan. He's awesome. He, he, uh, yeah. So, and we're a fan. I'm a fan too. And uh, I'm really excited to get you on here. Won't be the last time. We'll get you on again. In fact, we'll, we'll get, we'll have to try to get you on later in the year, maybe at the big 10 tournaments. If you're there, we'll have to figure something out there. Well, well I gotta, cause I feel like you, you're you going to be following the league, but you're going to be following your sister. And you're gonna have some stories to tell throughout the year. I have a feeling. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm the biggest Michigan softball fan right now. Nobody knows it. Um, <laughs> I need to get more gear actually, but yeah, I'll be following her around. So I'd love to do something like that in the future. All right. Well, we look forward to that. In the meantime, enjoy it. Enjoy the ride there. I know that's going to be fun. And uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, it's a blast to talk to you. I uh, want to have you for a while, and we'll definitely do it again. And uh, keep up the great work. Back at you, Eric. Thanks so much.